It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. The Warsaw Conference of 2019, which is a meeting of foreign ministers from many countries around the world, has just ended this year. The main item on the agenda was Iran. Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel, who is also Israel's foreign minister, attended the meeting and his office is allegedly have leaked this 30-minute video from the internal discussions. Here's a short segment from a leaked video, which we hear the Bahraini foreign minister, Mohammed El Khalifa, saying that Iran is the most toxic challenge in modern history. We grew up talking about the, the Palestine-Israel dispute as the most important issue that we have to see either solved or one way or another. But then, at the later stage, we saw a bigger challenge. We saw a more, a more toxic one. In fact, the, more, the most toxic in our modern history, which came from the Islamic Republic, from Iran. Because Iran is a country. Iran is people. Iran is civilization. Iran is the peace-loving nature of its own people, but not the theophascist regime. And if you have any doubt that this was uh, re released to, uh, or leaked, uh, here's Prime Minister Netanyahu himself speaking about the conference and what took place in his own words. I have just come from an excellent meeting with Oman's minister responsible for foreign affairs. We discussed additional steps we can take together with countries in the region in order to advance common interests. From here, I'm going to meet with 60 foreign ministers and envoys of countries from around the world against Iran. What is important about this meeting and this meeting is not secret because there are many like those in that this is an open meeting with representatives of leading Arab countries that are sitting down together with Israel in order to advance common interests of war with Iran. Now joining me to discuss all of this is Vijay Prasad. Vijay is the director of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, and he's also the chief editor of Leftward Books that's celebrating their 20th anniversary in a few weeks. Welcome, Vijay. Thanks a lot. All right, Vijay, um, let's uh, unpack that uh, statement by the Bahraini uh, foreign minister um, and, of course, what Netanyahu there uh, said as well. It's interesting that they use words like fascism to define the Iranian government. You know, we should be clear that we're talking about Gulf Arab states, which are monarchies, authoritarian governments. There's no elections. Uh, they have very little representative uh, structure. These are mostly either, you know, kings as in Saudi Arabia, or they are small level emirs in Bahrain, in Qatar, in, um, you know, the United Arab Emirates and so on. So the fact that they are complaining about what they call the regime in Iran on the grounds of, say, fascism or authoritarianism is not uh, with an ounce of credibility. On the other side of it, we know very well that Mr. Netanyahu is going into a parliamentary election very soon. And in Israel, it's quite clear that Netanyahu does well when he is aggressive in terms of foreign policy. Inside Israel, there are serious problems and crises of legitimacy for not only Mr. Netanyahu, but for the entire Israeli political system. You know, there have been economic problems, there's the intractable issue of Israeli apartheid against the Palestinians. So, you know, it's quite clear that both the Israelis on the one side and the Gulf Arab states on the other want to demonize Iran uh, in order to maintain their own flagging hegemonies. Now, Vijay, um, it's a, a serious conference with foreign ministers at the table, and they're so openly talking about a war with Iran. Um, how real is this possibility? Well, let's look at who came to the conference. I think this is important. 
You know, the United States sent the top level people, Mike Pence, the vice president, uh, Pompeo came there, the secretary of state, they even brought Rudy Giuliani to speak outside the conference, uh, essentially to an Iranian terrorist group, where he, much more than people inside the conference, declared war against Iran. Uh, but meanwhile, the Germans didn't send any high-level people, the French didn't send high-level people, and the European Union didn't send any high-level people. This is very important, Sharmini, because these are the signatories uh, to the Iran nuclear deal. In other words, they, know, they knew that after the United States had walked away from the Iran nuclear deal, they knew that this year's conference in Warsaw was going to be comical, was going to be filled with threats of war, essentially the opposite of diplomacy, which is why these countries stayed away. And I think the United States should see this as a great embarrassment that its vice president, its secretary of state went to a conference where the counterparts to them, in other words, heads of governments, perhaps of Britain, of France, of Germany, of the European Union, foreign ministers, Frederica Mogherini, people like that, essentially snubbed them and left the United States with, you know, its Gulf Arab friends, with the Israelis, to talk in a kind of cesspool way about war. You know, they don't have any alliances uh, which are willing to give them a fig leaf in Iran. The Europeans are not going to kind of come in and, and you know, adult, make adult uh, the war against Iran. They are very opposed to it. And I think the Europeans, in terms of Iran, will do everything to prevent conflict. Of course, the situation is different, Sharmini, vis-a-vis -vis Venezuela, where the Europeans seem as eager as the United States, or perhaps lackadaisically as eager as the United States, to have some sort of military confrontation in Venezuela. Certainly with Iran, they, they know that they are absolutely reliant on uh, future Iranian oil sales, so they don't want a war. And it was clear in Warsaw that the real uh, party that was, in a sense, humiliated was not Iran, but it was the United States government led by Donald Trump. Vijay, Mohammed Javad Zarif, the foreign minister of Iran, was recently interviewed on NBC. And he was asked whether he's open to renegotiating the Iran deal with uh, Mr. Trump uh, directly. And here's what he said. President Trump has said he's open to meeting one day with your president, the Iranian president, potentially to renegotiate the Iran deal. Why should we renegotiate a deal which we spent not just a couple of hours meeting, but 13 years to negotiate? And we negotiated with the United States. Why should we trust President Trump that he would abide by his own signature? We're talking about a country that has withdrawn from every known treaty, from INF, from UNESCO, from uh, Council on Human Rights, from NAFTA, from whatever, you, you name it, they've withdrawn from it. All right, now, Vijay, uh, clearly, as you said, the foreign ministers from many of the European nations, the counterparts of, uh, or the allies of the United States, were not at this meeting, and clearly the foreign minister of Iran here uh, is still locked into this agreement with Europe. And this reinforces your point, which is it is the United States here that's isolated. So um, what will, uh, what should Iran be doing uh, in terms of uh, if, if this threat is real about war and Trump does approach him and say, you know, I want to talk uh, about the agreement, uh, what are Iranians going to really do, uh, you know, with this threat of war held over their head? I think it's important for Americans and others to know that um, Mr. Zarif, the foreign minister, is an extraordinarily smart man. He did a PhD at the University of Denver uh, on self-defense in international uh, law and diplomacy. This is a man who knows what he's doing. Uh, so when he makes that kind of statement, uh, he's essentially saying to the Europeans that, look, you and us, that is the Europeans and the Iranians and the United Nations are quite happy with this deal, which was ratified by the United Nations. Uh, we want to hold by it. You want to hold by it. That is the Europeans. You don't want to break this deal. 
This is something that the United States is doing by itself as a party to the deal it has walked away. I think this is a very clever strategy because he knows that the Europeans and the United States have divided. Uh, he's going to essentially sit on this divide, uh, not uh, you know, uh, try to bring them together in any way. He's not trying to ruffle any feathers. You know, it's important for people to know that it was Mr. Mike Pence, the vice president of the United States, who went to the Warsaw Conference and attacked the Europeans. You know, he, he essentially accused them of letting the United States down. Uh, this is, of course, not going to make uh, allies and friends of the Europeans on this issue. Uh, so Zarif is playing a very key role here in making sure the Europeans know that he is going to abide by international law. And I really think that on this issue, uh, for the United States, for the Gulf Arabs, and for Israel, it's going to be very difficult uh, to move towards a situation of war. Mr. Zarif also said in that interview that a war would be suicidal. And again, Sharmini, the parallel uh, with Nicolas Maduro of Venezuela is quite interesting because Maduro last week said that a war against Venezuela would be a re replay of the U.S. war on Vietnam, another suicidal war. And I think that these people are quite aware that there's going to be a lot of threats thrown around. There'll be a lot of psychological uh, warfare happening, economic warfare. But I think they know that the United States it might have the capacity to do one or two aerial bombarding runs against Tehran or Caracas, but they know that the United States doesn't have the appetite to be in the middle of about four or five theaters at the same time, still embroiled in Afghanistan, caught up in the Sahel region of Africa, still not fully pulled out of Iraq. And I think the appetite for a war in Iran and in Venezuela is very low. And finally, Vijay, why are the European nations so easily uh, giving up uh, Venezuela to the Americans in this way? And they have dug their heels in uh, on Iran. I mean, this is a very interesting discussion. And I wish we had somebody from the European Union to talk to about this openly on camera, because there's a kind of hypocrisy involved here. On Iran, the Europeans are standing fast to questions of the nuclear deal, uh, to questions of the United Nations Charter, uh, to issues of international law, as it were. The, the Europeans are making a lot of this. In fact, what is there on the table is that the Europeans look forward to the full return of Iran into supplying them with energy. After all, the Libyan uh, market has been destroyed. Libya is not near what it was producing for the European market before the destruction in 2011. There remain sanctions against Russia, so Russian energy having a hard time entering Europe. It's Iranian energy that could, in a sense, forestall Europe's major energy crisis. So they have a material interest in standing by international law when it comes to Iran. When it comes to Venezuela, I think they are demonstrating uh, that they don't really abide by international law, the UN Charter, uh, the sovereign rights of countries to have their own you know, uh, um, legal uh, standards and so on. They seem to have thrown that all overboard when it comes to Venezuela. Some of that because they don't have a material interest at stake in the same way as they do with Iran. That demonstrates how shallow their commitment is to international law and the rule of law. So, I mean, in this sense, it's disappointing to see the Europeans who always speak in the most high-minded language, but here again have been revealed to be reducible to their own material interests. I've been speaking with Vijay Prasad, the director of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research and chief editor at Left Word Books. Vijay, as always, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks a lot. And thank you for joining us here on The Real News Network.